Good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Jesse Waters. I run Banks Mill Feeds. Um, I want to say thank you for taking um, a few moments out of your your busy evenings to uh, join us. And um, um, Dr. Cube is going to go over some of the new things uh, we've done with the feeds, some of the new technologies and research uh, that have gone into them, as well as um, what Dr. Cube and Dr. Duran with Performance Horse Nutrition. Um, service they offer directly to you as the customer. Um, so once again, thank you for showing up. Also, we did promise that we'd be giving out some swag. Uh, usually we do door prizes and raffles. However, um, this format's a little difficult. So I picked two names at random. Um, what I'll do is um, once Dr. Cubitz gets going, I'll shoot you a text message and uh, get your contact info. So the first winner is Nancy Aldridge, and the second is Kelly Brazell. Uh, that's all I got, Dr. Cubitt. Thanks, Jesse. I just wanna thank you all again for joining into tonight's webinar. Um, at the beginning of the year, I said, I know you probably aren't familiar with this type of format, but by now, I'm sure every one of you have been on at least one webinar, whether it be with kids and Zoom or Facebook Live or a go-to meeting this year. So it's probably not that new to you, but I really appreciate you getting on. Um, earlier in the year, it was probably around March, um, Performance Horse Nutrition partnered with Banks Mill Feeds and uh, we started helping Jesse with all of the formulations, giving some suggestions on potential new feeds. Um, so we're excited that all of those new feeds are on the market now. And what I wanted to do today was just go over a little bit about performance horse nutrition so you can kind of understand where Jesse was thinking, um, partnering up with performance horse nutrition. And as Jesse mentioned, what benefits do you as the customers get from uh, Banks Mill partnering with a, an equine nutrition consulting company like ours? I want to touch on a couple of the new technologies that I think are real groundbreaking technologies um, and then touch on the new feeds. In future webinars, I'd love to go over all of the changes that we've made with um, the existing signature line as well. But we all know these webinars can get a little boring. So we'll keep it short tonight and we will hope to do more in the future. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. If you're listening to this as a recording, please email Jesse and we will get you the answers. At the end, we will open it up for questions as well. So I just want to touch on kind of the investment. I always think that when a company, one of our clients, um, partners with Performance Horse Nutrition, they're making an investment. Their, their investment to give you, the customers and the dealers, some quality, uh, either a quality product for the dealers to sell or quality products for customers to use with their horses. Um, they're we're putting together products with nutritional merit. Every single product, every single new technology we bring to the table for any of our clients is backed and supported by science in horses. Um, we make sure that we may take the most complicated science, but we want to make sure that it is consistent, it's easy to read, and it's easy feeding directions and you know you will look at these feeds and you'll know which lane they fit in um, so that there's not oh well which feed should I be trying I'm not quite sure they really fit in a particular category well and then also we've helped with the packaging because we all know that packaging whilst the importance is in the bag we really want the packaging to reflect the quality of that product as well um, so they chose to invest in performance horse nutrition. A little bit about performance horse nutrition. It was founded in 2002 by Dr. Stephen Duran. Um, and his goal, he had worked with several other uh, f nutrition consulting companies. Um, but his goal was really when he started performance horse nutrition to advance the science of feeding horses. And that kind of sounds um, complicated, but really it's, Going back to what I said earlier, taking the most complicated science and making sure that 
whether we're speaking to veterinarians, um, you know, three-day event riders, 4-H kids, pony club kids, everybody can understand that information and feels like that they um, get something out of uh, their conversations with us. So Dr. Duran has, you know, so many letters after his name, but he will always tell you he's most proud of being a dad to two kids who are no longer kids. They're grown adults. He lives in um, Idaho. Uh, he's got a bachelor's of science from the University of Idaho, animal science, did his master's and PhD at the University of Kentucky. And Dr. Duran, he is engrossed in the racing world and he loves anything to do with nutrition and exercise physiology um, and really applies that to all different sporting disciplines, but he he really thrives when it comes to exercise and nutrition. Uh, myself, I am a mom of two boys. Um, I would spell that M-U-M because I'm also a native of Queensland, Australia. I moved over here in 2001 and did a master's and PhD at Virginia Tech. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Queensland in animal science. I focused my master's on equine nutrition and growth, and then my PhD focused on equine nutrition and reproduction. There are kind of several aspects of what performance horse nutrition does. We've got three primary consulting focuses. We work with feed and supplement manufacturers all over the world. We work with certain private farms and training facilities on a one-on-one -on -one basis where they will have a contract with us. Um, and we also work with a lot of veterinarians and biotech companies, helping them with kind of practical application of, of products. But the two bullets in the middle there, we will work directly with your farm or facility if you're using one of our clients' products, be it one of our supplement manufacturers, one of the bank's mill feeds, um, you don't have to pay that fee. We will work for you. That is a value add that that company brings to the table. They pay for our services so that you guys can use, use our, um, our resources. What do we do for bank smell feeds? What does the partnership look like particularly and what can you expect from performance source nutrition? Well, for Jesse and the team, we uh, do new product development. We're constantly evaluating new technologies. Every time you turn the page or look at another Google page, there is another thing that somebody is trying to get you to feed to your horse um, on the internet or in some blog or Facebook group. And so we make sure that we're never trying to add technologies that aren't backed by science and research. We're a resource to your dealers. You might go to your dealer and say, I am having this problem, and maybe that dealer is getting that question a lot. They can call us directly, and we can answer those questions for them. Or maybe they just have some feeding questions of their own so that they can answer their customers uh, more appropriately. When it comes directly to the customers, we'll answer questions, troubleshoot tough feeding scenarios. Uh, today alone, I've, I've been in touch with a couple of bank smell clients. Jesse will shoot me a text and say, hey, can you call this, this person? They're having these issues. Maybe um, they've changed hay and their horse has got diarrhea. Um, how can I help? Or they're looking to change to bank smell feeds, but they're unsure of how to transition or what feeds to feed. Can we develop a program for uh, the whole farm? Evaluating forage reports. You know, you will find when I talk about basic nutrition in future webinars that there is nothing that comes in a bag or a bucket that is more important than the forage that your horse will eat. And when I'm talking about forage, I'm talking about hay and pasture, the fiber that your horse eats. That is the most important part of your horse's diet. And oftentimes, if we have a facility that is large enough and it gets enough quantity of hay, um, we will suggest doing a hay test. And from that hay test, we'll get a forage report and we need to be able to evaluate that. And I can help do that. And then we can design specific diets and programs around the hay. Because unfortunately, we out here on the East Coast, I live in Culpeper, Virginia right now. Um, we don't really have access to great quality hay. Um, so 
but it's all we have available to us because hay is also at a premium and it is often at a shortage. So we have to work with what we've got. So some years it might be better than others and we find our horses are gaining weight. Some years they're losing weight. So we need to be able to evaluate forage and design programs to go with that. We also will help develop diets and uh, work with directly with veterinarians. We all have a, a team, right, working at our facility. You're a farrier, you're a veterinarian, you have a dentist, maybe you've got some body workers or massage therapists with for your horses. And it's it's really important that everybody's on the same page to w working towards the goal that you have for your horses in your program. So let's touch on some of that new technology. There's really two new technologies that we have implemented in the new bank smell feeds. And the first, you may have heard of it before. Um, it is a marine derived calcium. Um, it actually comes from red algae. The brand that we're using is a product called Calci Powder Advance, and it's got such amazing buffering capacity that it will help to reduce gastric ulcers and also enhance bone density because it's really bioavailable for the horses. So I mentioned it's from fossilized red algae and it's rich, rich in minerals, but primarily um, a really bioavailable calcium source. On the feed tag, you will recognize it on our feed tags as Calcite. The American Association of Feed Control Officers um, recognizes that term. That's the correct term. You may see other terms listed on feed tags, marine derived calcium, but they're incorrect terms. AFCO recognizes it as Calcite. And the main difference between calcite and other products like limestone, which is calcium carbonate, which is a typical calcium source that we will use in equine feeds, is if you look at it under a microscope, it's the structure. And it's a little hard to see in this picture, but if we go one step further, you can see this honeycomb structure. So when you look at calcium carbonate under a microscope, um, it's got a very solid surface area. But if you look at calcite under a microscope, it looks like this. And you can see because of the honeycomb structure, it's got so many different surfaces that will come in contact with the acid in the horse's stomach to have buffering capacity. But also if we move further down the digestive tract and think about the small intestine where calcium is going to be absorbed um, for bone health, then it's got a lot more surface areas for enzymatic digestion and absorption. I'm very visual, so I love this graphic of looking at the buffering capacity of three typical buffers that are used in equine feeds and supplements. Sodium bicarbonate, if we take um, the same quantity, the same weight, of each of these ingredients. And you look at that soccer field there, um, sodium bicarbonate has the buffering capacity of like the goal area at the end. Calcium carbonate has, a, has the buffering capacity of the circle in the middle. And calcium powder, though with its honeycomb structure, has the buffering capacity of the whole uh, the whole soccer field. And that's just because of the exponential surface area with that uh, actual physical structure. So why is this important? Um, if I look at the stomach, I can actually break it down into two main sections. If we cut a window in it and we look inside, there's the bottom section called the glandular mucosa, or I'll just call it the protected region. Because you can see in the photograph, there's this mucousy coating that covers or lines that dark pink tissue because that dark pink tissue is constantly secreting there are little cells there called parietal cells and they're constantly secreting acid because remember the horse is a grazing animal and he's meant to be grazing for about 17 hours out of the day and so he doesn't have a meal response he is continually secreting acid in his stomach and unfortunately what happens when we put him in a stall and he's not constantly chewing, is that acid will build up and build up and splash up onto what we call the squamous mucosa or the non-protected region. 
and right above this line, the line between the two, we call the Mago Placatus. And most of our stomach ulcers are going to occur right above that line into that non-protected region. And it's because that acid is building up, it's getting really strong, it's splashing up there. When you think about a horse chewing and swallowing, there's an actual physical mat of fiber that sits on top of that acid as well. But again, if we're not constantly feeding our horses something, then that mat is not there and that acid can splash up. This is a really good graph of a study done at Virginia Tech um, looking at the acidity in the horse's stomach when they have free choice access to grass hay. So for a 24 hour period, these horses had a little probe down in their stomach. It's a little thing that they swallow and it measures the acidity and we measure acidity in the horse's stomach using a, the unit's pH, which you can see on the left hand side there. Now anything between a four and a seven, so seven is the um, strength of water that's neutral and four, it's starting to get more acidic, but between a four and a seven is the healthy range. You can see that where these, as these horses are eating, the acid is sitting between a four and a seven. Anything above this yellow line between that four and seven is healthy, that is normal. But unfortunately what happens, if we take away all of the hay and grain for that same 24 hour period, it takes only 30 minutes for food to pass through the stomach. Now it's going to hang out in the hindgut, the, the colon and the large colon and small colon and cecum for up to 65 hours, but it can be passed through the stomach in as little as 30 minutes. And you can see here in just one hour, the acid in this horse's stomach plummeted down to between a one and a two. And that is the strength of non diluted, non um, you know, altered or buffered equine stomach acid. But that's not what's supposed to sit in the horse's stomach. It's supposed to sit in there with saliva buffering it and food diluting it. Um, so we've got here by one hour, we're down between a one and a two in that super strong acid. By 18 hours, these horses had bleeding lesions. But what's probably more occurring in our horses is by less than six hours, these horses had developed reddening in the stomach lining. And what is reddening? It's inflammation. And that is the beginning of all bad things is inflammation. And after inflammation, then we start to see ulceration as that tissue wears away and debrides. What's not uncommon this time of year because it's dark at five o'clock and if it's overcast, it seems to be dark at 3.30. But let's just say we're feeding our horses at five o'clock at night. They're done their hay by seven, which means from the last mouthful they took, 30 minutes later, everything can be out of the stomach. And maybe we don't have the luxury of a, a night check at our barn or we're not giving our horses night, night hay and they're eating it really quickly. Um, and we're not coming back till seven, six, seven o'clock the next morning, that's an 11 or 12 hour window where the horse has nothing to chew on and they're literally chewing wood, chewing anything in sight just to try and buffer that stomach acid. So you can see with our pretty benign um, management practices, how easily it can be to create gastric ulcers in horses. About 90% of performance horses have gastric ulcers, about 60% have them in the hindgut, and about half the population have them in both regions. Now, this study was done back in 2005, and we're now in 2020, and I can tell you that these numbers have not changed. They've not gotten any better because we haven't altered the way we manage horses, we haven't altered their stress, um, we're using a lot of band-aids, but I want to look at practices that can, we know that there's stress that we can't take away from horses. So we, we meal feed horses because it's what practically fits into our lifestyle. We have to feed high grain diets to a lot of our horses because they're, they need a lot of calories for energy or weight maintenance. Um, sometimes we're not feeding enough forage to our diets. We can change all of those things. We can make sure that they've got hay more frequently. We can split up the meals into small meals frequently. We can use more high fat, high fiber type feeds. 
Um, but what we can't change in a lot of horses is the stress that comes from transport and stabling and intense exercise. Um, those are stresses that we can't change. The other thing that will cause gastric ulcers is long-term use of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like bute. And the mechanism is that that bute over time will actually wear away at that mucus coating in the bottom part of the stomach, allowing that acid access to that tissue. So what we want to do is add things to the feeds that we're creating that are going to help mitigate some of this stress that we're putting on our horses, some of this um, uh, decrease in pH that we're seeing. So this was some research done in collaboration with Performance Horse Nutrition in the University of Kentucky, looking at the calcium powder, replicating the stomach environment, stomach acid environment. And actually, at time zero, well, before time zero, we were measuring the uh, stomach acid in a beaker. We've got some hydrochloric acid that's mimicking uh, gastric acid. And then at time zero, we add three grams of calcium powder. And you can see almost immediately, we've got a rise in the pH of that acid. And for the length of the study, it continued to rise. And what I think is really good about this is it sat between that four and seven in that healthy range. There are other supplements on the market that will actually that we tested that will actually take that acid all the way out of that healthy range and make it kind of the opposite of acidic, which is what we call basic, which is soap or bleach or ammonia. Um, and at that point, we've kind of got some negative effects as well. So we really want the buffering capacity to sit between that four and seven, which this did quite nicely. This was some original work done on these algae or marine derived calcium sources on ulceration in adult horses done in New Zealand. They took 10 horses, varying ages and sex um, and did a gastroscopy on day zero and found every single horse had a, some degree of ulcers from a one to a three. And then for 30 days, they fed them a supplement containing the calcium powder. And then on day 30, they did another gastroscopy. And what's pretty significant, I think, is that 100% of those horses significantly reduced their ulcer score, and 70% of those horses had an ulcer score of zero after 30 days. So the three that hadn't gone to a zero had at least gone down to a one. So they were pretty minor ulcers. But another area that I think marine-derived calcium is really important for is bone development. Um, and it's so bioavailable that it plays, uh, we know that calcium plays an important role in bone, bone turnover. So if we can feed these young stock and broodmares a more bioavailable source of calcium, is that going to help with bone density? Um, and so this study uh, done in the US had 14 yearlings, four geldings and 10 fillies um, and supplemented them with either calcium carbonate or the marine derived calcium. So they were all getting the same quantity of calcium, but just from different sources. And what we're gonna look at here is a bone marker, so a hormone called osteocalcin. And we can measure osteocalcin in the blood and it is a biochemical marker for bone formation or bone turnover from that uh, cartilage to, to bone, we're going to secrete more osteocalcin. And so if we've got a lot of osteocalcin, that means that we've got a lot of um, bone being formed. And so the animals that got calcium carbonate or limestone are represented in the blue bars and the orange bars represent the horses that were getting supplemented with the marine derived calcium. And at every time point of um, the study, 28 days, 56 days, 84 and 112, these horses all had, these foals all had elevated osteocalcin, significantly elevated osteocalcin. So much higher bone, turno bone turnover and bone formation. Now let's look at a slightly older age group. Now these are still uh, young horses. They were two-year-olds that were in exercise. They were thoroughbreds in training. 
um, and looking at actual bone density in thoroughbred horses. And you can see at 30 and 90 days, the blue bars or black bars represent the horses that were getting um, calcium carbonate and the red bars were supplemented with marine derived calcium. This study is really quite um, impressive. The increased bone density on two different planes of the bone when animals were fed this, this calcium supplement. So we've touched on the marine derived calcium that we've incorporated in all of the new pro series feeds, but I wanna to touch on a second technology. It's called Chemtrace Chromium, and it's the first product of its kind on the market. It's backed by 20 years of research in, in all different species, peer reviewed research, um, so it wasn't just a research that was published in a magazine. This is peer-reviewed um, scientific journals, registered in over 35 countries, manufactured in America and sourced from U.S.-based ingredients, which we know this year with the uh, you know, closing of the borders has been extremely important. It's, uh, chromium is a water-soluble, highly available um, organic source. Um, of this mineral. And what does chromium do? It is actually improves glucose utilization and we'll get into that a little bit further. How does that benefit a horse? Well, every function in your body or your horse's body is actually fueled by glucose. Glucose is the energy source for life as well as oxygen, but oxygen is not really an energy source. But So we need glucose. Um, it's going to help with the immune function. Horses with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, chromium is going to help there, but also with athletic performance, milk production. I mean, there are so many areas that glucose is used. And by adding chromium to the diet, we can improve that uh, pathway. March of this year, Chemtrace Chromium was approved by the FDA for use in the horses, and it's the first and only FDA approved chromium source for use in horses. It's, it's actually chromium propionate. Propionate is a volatile fatty acid that's created by the bacteria in the hindgut. So, I'm as I've mentioned, I'm very visual, and this is my graphic to explain kind of how glucose and insulin work together. Because we talk about insulin resistance often, if you've had a horse with insulin resistance, we talk about high resting or basal or blood glucose and insulin. And, and what does that mean? Um, so m how I like to describe it to people is we've got a door that's got a handle and a key, and a lock and a key, and we've got a person, okay? So the key, is insulin. The lock that that key is going to go into is the insulin receptor. The door that that lock is attached to, that's the glucose receptor. And the person that's standing on the outside of the door, that is glucose. So in order for glucose to go from one side of the door to the other, so from the outside of the cell to inside the cell, first we've got to get a key and we've got a put that insulin into the insulin receptor, and then that insulin receptor is going to unlock the glucose receptor, and then the glucose, which is the person, is going to walk through the door. And what that looks like on an actual cell is this graphic here. In a normal cell, we've got the red glucose, little beads floating around. When we have a lot of glucose in the blood, the pancreas says, oh, there's a lot of glucose. We've got to secrete insulin. So it'll secrete insulin and that insulin will fly in and it's supposed to attach to the insulin receptors, which unlock the glucose receptors and allow the glucose to go into the cell. But in an animal with insulin resistance, the lock's broken, right? So we got all this insulin that's come to the party to try and help glucose get out of the bloodstream and into the cell, but very few of the locks are working, so the key just keeps hanging around outside. So we have then elevated blood glucose, elevated insulin. Sometimes these horses get hungry, uh, they're overeating, weight gain. We've all seen those weird fat deposits on these horses, crest, back, tail, head, reduced energy levels. Obesity, um, it's, it's one of the first things that we see and obesity also um, is partnered with the systemic inflammation. 
Um, and so a simple thing like rain rot or scratches on the leg can be exaggerated because they're causing inflammation. And then we've got systemic body inflammation, whole body inflammation that's compounding that and making it worse. So what might have been a simple rain rot on a healthy horse on a horse with insulin resistance is a nightmare because it doesn't ever seem to go away. The actual elevated insulin, all that insulin that's floating around in the bloodstream and not going anywhere, insulin is not meant to just float around in your bloodstream. So all of that insulin sitting around can also be causing damage. It can be constricting blood vessels. Um, that can be one of the mechanisms to lead to laminitis. So we want to make sure that we don't have all that insulin floating around. Oops. So what I want to do really quickly is this is a video that Chemtrace has uh, put out and I think it really explains the role of glucose and insulin and then the role of chromium to that little um, partnership as well. So uh, I'm going to play it and hopefully you can all hear it. Okay, so to summarize, we talked about insulin and how it binds to the insulin receptor and it allows then the glucose to go through the door. When you add chromium, think about it like your house has one door on the front of it. But now chromium is attaching and allowing us to have like 15 different doors, actually it's an eight fold. So let's say eight different doors on the front of our house. So now eight different glucose molecules can go through the front door at the same time. So we're getting more glucose into the cell. That glucose is, can be used for performance. And what is performance to your horse? It might be a lactating broodmare who needs more energy to produce milk. It might be a growing foal who needs more nutrients to grow. It might be a racehorse that, or a horse that wants to go faster. And we know that glucose is going to feed those fast twitch muscle fibers. It might mean that we've going to um, improve the locks, the broken locks on an insulin resistant horse. So there are so many different ways that that extra glucose can get used. So adding chromium to the diet is a real game changer.
So I mentioned insulin unlocks the door and adding chromium allows uh, more glucose to get into the cell. We think of specifically about performance or fast, high intensity performance. When we're doing lower intensity exercise, like hunter classes or trail riding or lower level dressage, where we're not doing anything at any speed, 42% of your energy comes from fat and about 58% come from carbohydrates, your sugars and starches. But as you start to increase the speed and intensity of that exercise, the amount of energy source substrate being used from fat goes down and the amount of carbohydrates goes up. The other problem with horses is they don't recover very well because we eat food, we break it down, it goes into the in, it gets absorbed and it actually gets stored as glycogen in the muscle. Then your horse goes and it runs a barrel pattern or it does um, polo or a race and it uses all the glucose out of its muscle cell and then it's got to put it back so that it can exercise again. And that glycogen repletion is very slow in horses and adding chromium to the diet actually can speed up that repletion of those muscles. So it decreases um, our fatigue. It increases the time it takes for a horse to fatigue and it also decreases the amount of time it takes for a horse to recover from that exercise. Something else that we don't really think about often is that when a horse is stressed, that is going to release a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol, just like we talked about osteocalcin being a marker for bone development, cortisol is the gold standard measure for stress in horses. And if we see a rise in cortisol, it means that horse is, is increasing in its stress. But what that cortisol does is it signals to the body to shunt glucose or nutrients away from wherever it's currently being used and take it to the area that's stressed to try and minimize that stressor. So if we've got horses that are growing that's going to be sacrificed. If we've got horses that are exercising, that performance is going to be um, to be minimized. So adding chromium is just going to allow your horse to have more glu glucose available for all the different areas that it needs to be used. And we know that stress comes in every different uh, avenue to our horses. So Finally, I'll just touch on the brand new line, the premium line of feeds that we have created. It's called the Pro Series Feed, and you can see the updated bags there on the right-hand side. Every single one of these feeds has 100% natural vitamin E, which should be standard in all feeds today, but it's not. 100% natural vitamin E because horses get vitamin E from fresh green grass, and most of our horses do not get enough fresh green grass in their diet. Um, they really need to eat about 17 hours out of the day, fresh green grass, to get enough vitamin E. So it's really important that we are supplementing our horses with natural vitamin E. So all the vitamin E in these products is 100% natural. 100% organic selenium. We know that vitamin E and selenium work together as powerful antioxidants. Um, and again, the inorganic form of selenium is sodium selenite um, and it is what I consider a rock type mineral. Organic selenium what we do is we take that rock type selenium that we've mined out of the ground and we take a tiny tiny plant yeast and we grow that yeast on the on that rock selenium and that yeast absorbs the selenium and then we feed the horse that yeast that is uh, enhanced with that selenium. And that kind of leads me to the chelated minerals or organic minerals and why are they important to horses? Well, I want to start out by horses are designed to eat plants, not rocks. But all minerals are rocks. Okay, where's she going with this? If horses are meant to eat plants and she's telling me they need minerals, but minerals are rocks, how are they supposed to get minerals? Well, Plants have roots that go down into the ground and absorb minerals and nutrients and moisture up into the leaves and stems so that it can help it grow. The horse then eats that plant matter that
that has those minerals in it. And when those minerals are in that plant, they're in what we consider their organic form. They're attached to an organic substance. So they're going to be much more bioavailable to the horse so that they can actually be absorbed and not just go out into manure, your manure pile. So um, chelated minerals in all of these products, the calcium, the marine derived calcium or calcite is in all of these products. The chemtrace chromium is in all of these products. We've used what we consider super fiber. So you're going to see a lot of beet pulp and soy holes in these products because they're highly digestible. Another kind of pet talk of mine is talking about hindgut health and feeding the microbiome that lives in the hindgut of the horse. And in order to keep the horse healthy, you need to keep the microbiome healthy. And in, how you do that is feeding it a variety of different fiber sources. Um, so we're adding those to the feeds. All the feeds are very palatable, and we're also using very high quality protein sources. And when I mean high quality protein sources, we're looking at protein sources that are also going to bring those essential amino acids like um, lysine, methionine to the table. So we'll kind of start at the beginning at the least um, amount that you would feed per day. And this is the zone pellet. So the zone pellet has been in the Banks Mill lineup for quite some time. It was a two pound a day feeding rate. We've concentrated the nutrition and it's down to a one pound per day per, per thousand pound horse feeding rate. So I, the way I say, uh, my kind of general rule of thumb for who gets the zone pellet is if you have a horse that's eating less than three pounds of your grain concentrate per day, they need to get the zone. It's what we consider a ration balancer. It's a pellet. Um, horses that need to go on a weight loss dot program or they're eating hay and they're maintaining their weight very well. So they don't really need extra calories, um, but this is going to give them the vitamins and minerals they need. It's very low carb due to the feeding rate. It's one pound a day, so it's extremely low carb. I think most people are pretty familiar with ration balances, and when they see the 26% protein, it doesn't freak them out like it did when these products were uh, new to the market. Percentages really mean nothing unless they're attached to an amount. So I could write 100% on the screen, but it means nothing to you unless I attach it to an amount. What, 100% of a mouse? That Well, that's not very much. 100% of jumbo, jumbo jet? No, that's a lot. So 26% of one pound, well, it's a hair over four ounces. That's really not much when we're looking at in the grand scheme of horse feeding. It's low fat because this is meant to be more of that Jenny Crager diet balancer and low fiber because again you're feeding your horse um, hay or some kind of fiber source. You can also use this with an unfortified grain like oats for example um, to balance the diet. Let's say we're feeding some in somewhere in the lines of about three pounds per day, anything from three pounds up. Now we're looking at something like the Cool Stride. Now you'll notice that across the board, all of these um, Pro Series feeds are going to be lower in carbohydrates um, than your signature line of feeds. Um, this is a low carb, high fiber pellet. It's got that chromium in there, so it's going to improve the mode insulin. Um, action, mode of insulin action, help with metabolic syndrome, blood glucose, um, calm energy, light to moderate work, um, trail riding, uh, hunter, light, low hunter classes, maybe we've got easy keepers at a boarding, at a training stable, boarding training stable, where they need a little bit more than the balancer, but they don't need a full, full blown performance feed, a um, little higher in fat, and again, because it's only the minimum feeding rate is about three pounds a day, we've still got to concentrate it with um, a little more protein. Cool carb, this is our low carb pelleted feed. It's got no molasses or corn or oats or barley. Um, again, that chromium in there to improve glucose and insulin function. Now, a lot of times with our metabolic or, or laminitic courses, I go to, um, the balancer to the zone pellet. That's if the horse is fat. If the horse needs some more 
groceries to help maintain body weight or is exercising more, then the cool carb is really the ideal feed if you're riding a horse that's you know currently suffering um, from metabolic issues. The Sport 14 is across the board, 14 protein, 14 fat, 14 fiber. You're going to be hard pressed to find another feed on the market and with as high a fat, that's a, that's a full feed. Um, it's textured, it's high fat, high fiber, no corn, great for weight gain, very digestible, um, decreases the sensitivity to stress. A lot of our high performance horses are stress stressing because of the transporting and the intense exercise. Um, so also helps support gut health because we've really decreased the grains in it as well. The um, breeding feed is for broodmares, stallions and growing horses. The chromium is really going to help improve milk yield and immune response. And we know that foals are born with no immune response. So as much immune, uh, passive immune transfer that we can get from the mare to the foal uh, in utero is, is fantastic. We know that fat mares, their insulin sensitivity is decreased just due to their um, obesity. And we also know that mares, when they're cycling, their insulin sensitivity is already just naturally decreased. So you add a fat mare on top of that and it exacerbates that. So the breeding feed is designed for these pregnant mares, uh, foals, and stallions. If, however, you are like, ah, I've only got one brood mare and I've got a barn full of performance horses and I really don't want to bring in another feed. If she's a really fat mare, you can feed her the zone pellet or you can also do the Sport 14. We designed the Sport 14 so that you can feed this to brood mares and stallions and growing horses as well. And finally, the senior care. What we know is that older horses decrease their ability to deal with sugar and starch. They're not full-blown insulin resistant or metabolic now. A lot of them do get to that point, but um, just being senior doesn't make you uh, have metabolic syndrome. But we do know that their insulin sensitivity decreases. So old horses should not be eating high sugar starch diets. This has no corn, no oats, no barley. It's a pelleted feed because the true senior horse can't chew hay can't chew long stem hay. So you can see the fiber content has really increased because this can be fed as the sole ration. So this is what we consider a true complete feed. Typically though, if you do have a horse that is struggling um, with dentition and we want to feed, uh, we can't feed any long stem hay, I'll recommend doing the senior care and maybe adding in another forage pellet, whether it be an alfalfa pellet or um, a Timothy pellet just to give them a little bit more variety of fiber source, but this one can be fed on its own. So with that, I'll take any questions.